So just saying that um, between 1971 and Judd's death in 1994, um, Peter fabricated nearly 250 Judd works himself, sometimes also supervising other US and European fabricators on Judd's behalf. Since 1994, he's restored at least 500 Judd works. Ballantyne lectures and writes on Judd and Judd issues and implications and has curated 40 Judd exhibitions, including working papers at the Talbot Rice Gallery at the University of Edinburgh in 2012 and at Sprout Marga's Gallery in London um, the same year. Um, Peter is founding director of Advanced Visual Studies and the Judd Hume Prize, an international program based in Edinburgh with connections to the university's departments of art history philosophy and architecture and it's a great pleasure to see you and hear you with us finally today. yeah you too so i'll hand over to you without further ado peter uh after your introduction there's there's a there's you pretty much covered it i think um i um i think uh if you could give me a hint of where you want to go with this because i think the subject i i tend to come at this from the point of view of delegation mm -hmm. of of what i do what i did for judd and um as delegation and to some extent performance mm -hmm. uh in the sense of performing a script as an actor or performing a dance as a, a choreographer's dance or, or or as a musician and one of the, I get asked sometimes about, I, I, I started out with Judd as, as an art student uh, who, who was a painter and then a sculptor and like almost anybody who does that, um, you know your way around tools and making things. And I, I came to Judd as a, as a carpenter but a self-taught, not a, a, not a carpenter carpenter, but a, an artist doing carpentry and taught myself out of books and out of doing how to be quite a good carpenter. And the pieces that I made for Judd were um, mostly plywood pieces. And I became pretty good at that. I mean, I, I, became, I became very good at it and, uh, and, and, the question that I sometimes get asked is how, how do you do that? And, and how there's this point you have to make when you're working on somebody else's work on their behalf of how far you, it, it's easy to make it too good and you don't want to make it sloppy so that it sabotages the work. And there's a, a midpoint. For me, I always tried to reach a midpoint between those two things. The piece should be the piece that the pieces that I made from the drawings that I got or the non-drawings, the, the verbal descriptions that I got from Judd was to make the piece just the way it should be, not too perfect and not too imperfect. And that's, so what I use as my model was a, a kind of a hypothetical, really good carpenter, a traditional carpenter. And in fact, in some ways I was better than, than a, a, a traditional carpenter because I was coming at it with, from a little bit of a conceptual point of view, but I was, I was a kind of hypothetical carpenter and that's the, role I tried to play in Judd's work and Judd's work and that there should one of the reasons Judd went to fabrication in the first place in 1964 was that his hand was too prevalent and his inabilities or his uh, quality level was too low and you uh, and his hand his hand was too strong on the piece and and sabotaging of the piece and so you don't as a fabricator you don't also want your hand changing the piece on the other hand you are interpreting the piece and on the other hand in Judd's case I don't know whether we we've talked a bit about this on the phone a little bit but Judd delegated pieces extremely they were extremely delegated mm -hmm. um 
And there was there, so there was a lot of trust in that. And that system worked well for Judd, mostly. It worked well with me, but I was I was a carpenter, but I was also a, sort of a conceptual carpenter. In, in a way, the way my particular relationship with him needs to be sort of unsaid in a way that I, I, I like to present myself as a carpenter. I actually was more than a carpenter, but I was for now, for now and in my, in my mind, I like to think of myself as a carpenter uh, who could do the traditional job on a, on a very traditional assignment the very untraditional assignment. I'm not sure whether I'm explaining this very well, but um, the, the trick, I can tell, when I look at, I, I do a lot of restoration. I, the the, um, the, the uh, information I gave you about 500, I was being a little um, modest on that. It's probably more like 2000. Uh, pieces. And so I do a lot of restoration now. J Judd died 25 years ago, so I'm not making Judd pieces, but I'm restoring a lot of pieces and not just the pieces that I made, mostly not the pieces I made, mostly metal pieces from other fabricators. Mm -hmm. And um, In the, the one of the things that I'm sort of suited to the restoration thing because in in a way restora restoration of fabricated pieces comes very close to make to fabricating them because there's there's all, there's often problems with them and you have to sometimes even refabricate parts. But um, I'm, I'm not sure where what what where I want to take that, but. Um, well, I wonder yeah. if I can ask you a, yeah. a question, Peter. You, you talk yeah. about um, starting off getting to know Judd in the 19, late 1960s. Yeah. And I believe you, you, your building that you were living in was very close mm -hmm. to Judd's. It's this very uh, building where I'm sitting now, yes. The very building where you're sitting now. Wow, great. So, um, and I, I wonder, when you're talking about being a choreographer or, or doing producing a dance and the mm -hmm. carpentry not being too good, but it not being too bad either that it'd be invisible basically yeah do if it's possible do you think there's an extent to which Judd got to know you you through the things that you made and therefore kind of understood that touch of your hand in person rather than it and that being you know because he got to know you that meant that uh, there was an understanding there that was difficult to communicate through other media like the contracts and drawings that became problematic i, I think it was a i think it was a there, there was a, a trust that I could do it and the amount of specification became less and less. I, I, I think there was a low amount of specification also in some of the other fabricators because they were they, they were sheet metal workers and so forth. But, but before I before I leave the point I was going to make about um, about the restoration, one of the things about restoration is I'm seeing um, I'm seeing a lot of other people's work, uh, the sheet metal work, for example, and I can tell. I can tell from seeing that who made it, because it wasn't always made by the same person. I can tell. I, I'm pretty good for, at forensic uh, viewing of other people's work. I, I sort of know fabrication. I know making of things. I can sort of tell. So. In theory, there's only one way to do these pieces, the, the, the perfect in between too perfect and, and not perfect enough in theory, but actually there is a little bit of difference between the way this dancer dances this piece and some, where somebody else dances it. I, it's a tricky one because in theory, I would like there to be only one way that these pieces can be made and that they would always be made that by, that way by all other fabricators. But in fact, you can see by how the glue is done or how the, um, how the weld is done, that this was done by somebody different than, so, than somebody else. It, it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of an interesting thing. It's, it's, a, it's really not part of the art experience because most people a lot of this is is things that a lot of these things are things you see from the back of a piece or when you take a piece apart and um judd pieces 
are if you're really into jet pieces, if you know jet pieces to some extent, to some extent or a lot, they they're, they're quite interesting. They're they can be taken apart. I have a I have a a, 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 a couple of samples. I don't know whether you can see sort of like show and tell kinds of thing. These are parts of Judd pieces. Um, here's a, if you know the progressions here, here's a part of a progression. Mm -hmm. And so when they're taken apart or when they're made in the first place, they are a series of mechanical pieces and then they become art pieces and you don't know, you don't see all that mechanical stuff and the screws on the back and so forth. But in the same way as a good mechanic doesn't see a car by its body lines. You know, oh, look at this 1992 Saab. It's it's such a classic. Um, it's such a classic form. Uh, but actually, when those pieces are being worked on by a mechanic, the, they the body is taken off, and they're and it's a bunch of motor parts and wheels and and machinery. And I like that about these pieces. That's it starts to get a, a, a field of art per se, but I like to see the under the, I like to, I, I like, uh, I was an artist. I like to make things. I, I, I would never work the way Judd did, which is I, I like to make my own pieces when I was still making my own work. Um, his making, having other people make the work was really important. If you remember the essay of that catalog, somewhat remember it. I, I, I argue that his making, having other people make the pieces and at some quite serious remove, we, you were starting to tell the story about living close to Judd and him never coming over to the shop to look at pieces. Um, there are a lot of like really juicy stories about, about that that I could tell about. I mean, not juicy in a, rumor sense, but um, how extreme that was. And that's based on a kind of a sense of trust, but it's also based on a, a sense of making objects, capital O objects mm -hmm. and not sculptures. And that having them made in factories, I'm, I wasn't exactly a factory, I'm more of a very small shop, but let's call me a factory. If having the pieces made in factories using factory methods was really important to his claims that his pieces were objects mm -hmm. and not sculpture. And what objects are, you know, objects with a capital O. It's one of the things I'm trying to look at in Edinburgh, in the Edinburgh program, about what is an object, is, uh, is object just uh, a, a fancy word for sculpture, or is it really different from sculpture? Judd would argue it's different from scu sculpture and objects are two different things. Mm -hmm. And that's, we're starting to get a little in, into a, a little bit of, away from the subject perhaps, but that's uh, the fact that these are made by other people who know what they're doing. Um, occasionally there would be tears, uh, uh, not with my piece. I think there never were with my pieces, but I know of, I know a lot of stories of, of other pieces where there were, th that delegation thing, uh, th when it didn't work, it was the exception that proved the rule. Mm. Let's put it that way. I wonder actually on that note, just because it's such a great story, I remember you telling about maybe the final um, work in the relationship with um, the Bernstein Brothers factory in New York. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think in the essay that you mentioned that's in the catalogue for um, working... Did I tell you that story on the phone also? No, it was actually in the gallery, I think you, you told it. But um, oh, okay. you, talk break, about, you, uh, well, you talk about Judd um, ceding control in order to gain control. You know, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting. And, and I think the story is about the number of... Um, A number of bolts. Yeah. yeah, it's it. Do you want to? Should we tell that story now briefly? Please. Okay. Yeah. So there in 1977, there was a, uh, a commission. Judd had a commission of a very large piece for the Midwest for the Midwest. And um, it was a large monumental size piece. And Judd. Um, this is a, a whole other subject, but the, the, the subject of detail 
is an important one in Judd and uh, the, and lack of detail because detail quickly becomes image and uh, a, a piece with bolts or rivets all down the side can start to look like an airplane wing if you don't watch out. And then it's a dotted, it, then it's kind of a dotted line and the pieces are better, the fewer screws they have, the better. And if they magically just formed into a, a really large monumental piece with no screws whatsoever, it would be perfect because we don't really want the eye to be looking at all those screws and so forth. Bernstein Brothers, the fabricator, told Judd that they needed this many screws on this side to pull the large sheets of aluminum together. And he said, no, he didn't want that many screws cut it in half or do a quarter as many of that, and which is what they did. Piece was finished, shipped on a flatbed truck to Cincinnati, to Northern Kentucky, to this university, it was installed. And it was complained about later that you could see light through the joint parts uh, at certain times a day. And in other words, it wasn't the, 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 the warp of the metal hadn't been pulled in sufficiently. Um, Judd got the complaints from the, from the university that had commissioned it. He talked to Bernstein brothers. He said, I think you, you're going to have to go and add some more screws after, after all. And they said, they didn't say, I told you so. They thought, I'm, I'm sure they thought I told you so, but they said, okay, we'll do that. It's going to cost, I don't know, $3,000 or, or something to do that. And he said, no, no, it, it, it shouldn't be that way. It, it shouldn't have been that way. And it, we shouldn't have that problem. And of course they told him that. And of course he was embarrassed by this situation. And they said, um, we're, we need to charge this money for this job. We're going to have to go out there. We're going to have to take our tools. And um, I am a lot, was a lot younger than Bernstein Brothers. And it wasn't up to me to tell them, them just do it and take it as a loss. But I did. It wasn't up for, to me to do that. But I told them, just, just do this. Uh, don't fight on this. And they, they went to Cincinnati and they went to, Northern Kentucky, fixed the piece, sent the bill to Judd. He was really angry about it and stopped working with them, stopped talking to them. They were good. They had gone through all the birthing pains of working for Judd ever since 1964 when they made the first piece. He didn't stop. Um, he stopped talking to them, but he didn't stop using them which meant you have an even further level, even a deeper level of, um, of delegation or a break between the fabricators and the artist because he, it, it was indirect or it was by letter, but it was never, he never went out to Bernstein Brothers again in person. And it just sort of cemented that whole thing that this, this, there is not personal contact between the fabricator and the artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I'm not sure that that's the story you, that you wanted me to tell, but that's that's what happened. And for, so from 1977 to 1994, when he died, he kept using Bernstein Brothers and he never talked to them again. And so somebody like me or somebody else would talk to them. I mean, Judd had a kind of a fiery um, uh, personality and, and you know, uh, it, it was a mistake. It was a mistake on Bernstein's part. It was fair for them to charge for the for their work, but it was a mistake to do it. They should have taken it as a loss leader, as as the expression goes, and just eaten that bill. I wish they had because it would have been, it made a difference, or or something else would have happened. But it was, it's an example of this extreme delegation. And I can tell. I don't think we have a time for another story like this, but there's another extreme story like this. Please, I'd love to hear it. Okay, nineteen. Uh, 80. I don't know whether maybe you even saw the reconstruction of this piece, the reinstallation uh, of this piece in New York um, last year. But there's a large piece that in house was called the Sachi piece. 
It was shown at Boundary Road, Sachi's old place in 1984. Before that, it was shown, it was fabricated at um, Leo Castelli's gallery on Green Street, which turns out to be again, the gallery, which turns out to have been right across the street from my house, ironically. But this piece was 80 feet long and 12 feet high and uh, four feet deep. It took nine months to make this piece. It was a really tricky um, engineering job in an in a, in a 18th century kind of way. Lots of trusses and wires and things. And it had to be worked on from the back because it was too good. It went against the wall. It sat against the floor. And you had to work it from the back from a hollow passageway behind it, which meant there had to be a stage wall built almost with an opening almost the size of the piece, close, almost exactly the size of the piece with a door that you worked from behind. I'm not sure this is coming through as an explanation very well, but it, it was really interesting from behind um, with all these trusses and wire cross and turnbuckles and wires and things to keep this piece together, to assemble this piece from behind. Two days before the, the show is to open, Judd had not seen the piece while well, it was under construction, it was, I, I found it really interesting. I mean, it, I, I was uh, nervous about getting it done on time, but the back of it was very interesting in the, in a kind of coal mine kind of way, you know, with lights strung up. It was a, it was a space back there, a three foot space where you could work. And then at the very end, the door would be um, plastered over and you would just see a piece against the wall. Judd came two days before the opening, either because he was nervous that the piece wasn't going to get, wasn't going to be finished on time, or he couldn't stand, he was too curious, he wanted to see what it was, how it was what it was going to look like. He came um, and I said, Don, we're about to close up this entrance door. Um, do you want to see the back? And he said, no. And I was I, I, a mixture of disappointed and um, and quizzical about this whole thing. And I realized afterwards, I don't think he said this, but in my mind, he said this, this is the piece. That's not the piece. That's the mechanics that you had to use to make this piece. That's not the piece that piece I, is the piece from the front. And so I don't want to see that. And I, I took a lot of things from that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Judd didn't haunt the workshops, mine or Bernstein Brothers, especially after 1977, but also before. Um, and one of the things I take from that is he, Judd wanted the fabricators to work out the problems and figure out the problems. And he often called for pieces to be thinner material than a fabricator would normally say, you know, I think really to have stability over, or over eight feet like that, we ought to increase the, the thickness of the material. Judd, Judd would prefer that material to be really thin because he's not into mass and he's not into, um, even though there is a there is an architectural element of Judd's work, a serious architectural element in Judd's work, he's not. There's not a mechanical, um, structural engineer part to his work, at least from his side. That stuff is all to the fabricator, and it's up to the fabricator to try to figure out a way to make a thin sheet of material stay straight over eight feet or six feet or something like that. And, it, and it, it makes it very interesting to be a fabricator. But as far as Judd's concerned, it's not part of the art. No. It's not part of the art, capital A art. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I don't, I'm trying to make an analogies with architects and builders, but um, which you can make of course, but um, it, it's what made it interesting for me to do, to do this. And it, it's also what 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 the fabrication is and isn't 
to Judd. But what, one of the things that it is, is it's a guarantee of them being objects and not sculptures, for sure. I mean, you saw that in the catalog essay I, um, that I wrote for that 2012 show. But so I, I'm, I'm getting a little far afield here, but, uh, and I'm not answering your question, I don't think. But, but anyway, the, the, the subject of not, um, uh, of, of delegation and not um, appearing at the, you know, uh, coming over and inspecting the piece halfway done. I, I think pieces halfway done are, are uh, it, it's one of the best times to see a piece. Uh, and and from the back and um but not as far as he's concerned yeah. as he was concerned i mean so interesting i also wonder so uh, um i hope we can talk a little bit about giuseppe panza um yeah. who's a, a you know a prolific collector and a lot of his works ended up in the guggenheim collection um he collected lots of artists as well as judds um and the guggenheim um i think own well, they, oh, I've got the notes here, collected 27 Judd works, um, but 16 of those are contested in their attribution or mm -hmm. issues about how Panzer actually had the work made by people who weren't necessarily um, authorised. So that's been quite a large project of the Guggenheims, I believe, that you've been quite closely involved with. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you follow that or did you read all that stuff? Um, I've, I've read a fair amount. It's, it's an enormous archive, but incredibly interesting. But I, I was just wondering about if you could maybe talk a little bit about some of Judd's relationship with Panza, which started off as being, you know, a. a, a it was a good relationship at first, mm -hmm. and then how and, it. And how, did, do you do your do your does your group sort of know about Panza a little bit or what? Well, I mean, actually, we've got. Um, Eighty-five or so people in the call, and some I recognise are my students, but there's lots of people I don't recognise. Um, so it could be any, you know, these events are open to the public, so it could be some real Judd experts here and people who are less familiar. So I think you'd be safe to. Um, no, it, since you're, since you're, um, since I can't av avoid answering this, the, these kind of questions, I, I sometimes, um, w when it when I'm doing a lecture over at Spring Street, a Judd's building at Spring Street or down in Marfa or something like that, and I have a people who I really trust, I I, I sometimes start talking about things like Ponza and and Saatchi. Saatchi is another example of this. I don't know whether you know the Saatchi mm -hmm. saga or not uh, with Judd and Saatchi, but uh, the, let's stick with the Ponza thing for now. They're they're similar. Um, Ponza was uh, a collector who was had a conceptual bent and he, he was kind of an, quite an advanced collector um, it seemed at the time and would buy documents allow uh, from artists like Judd or Flavin or people of that uh, uh, or, or Sandback or people like that. And, and he would buy the right, in effect, the rights to build the pieces. And there was paperwork and it was signed and it was sort of, it, it seemed to be legal paperwork. And so he would buy the right to make a room size plywood work. It, where I come into this, because Ponza bought uh, quite a lot of Judds and they weren't all plywood, but my, I, I'm more known for as being the plywood fabricator and some of the pieces were plywood pieces. And I was asked to, to, to quote a price and Ponza said, no, 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 that's too expensive. We can, if we're gonna make this piece, we'll make it in Italy. We have, we have great craftsmen in Italy, old world. He, he's not using the term old world craftsmen, but um, I, I'm being a little, um, snide by saying that, but uh, we, we have our craftsmen, we know how to do this. And so Ponza uh, refused on the grounds, supposedly on the grounds of cost to have me come over and make the pieces, which is what Judd wanted. And Judd sort of gave in on the subject for some reason. And he, Ponza executed, fabricated uh, a number of pieces or two, two or three at first, and Judd went over to look at them and they were really bad. I wasn't, I didn't go on that. I wasn't along on that, but I saw the, all the pictures afterwards. And Ponza, I, I think Judd, 
Ponzi made made really bad versions of Judd pieces, and you could say, well, delegation aren't we aren't we in this aren't we in the field of delegation? And is it is this just a kind of a delegation that went amiss? And maybe there's a way of correcting this. Maybe it has to be done again. But Judd was furious at the uh, violence to his peace or he was jet lagged or or something i don't know but he was they, they, there was an immediate almost immediate fight between judd and ponza um about those pieces and judd eventually to, to cut the story story a little bit short judd eventually disowned those pieces mm -hmm. and considered them to be destroyed and um, so just to um, if and, I and the problem is a problem for me telling this story is that I'm sort of part of it, you know, that I and I, I had made a couple of that the, those kinds of pieces before. And when the Guggenheim did their symposium a year ago, almost a year ago, um, they got one of my pieces. And sort of partially installed it and they installed it next to part of one of Ponza's pieces and you and they're. I, it's not that. Oh, I'm, I, I'm the only one who can make these pieces. I think, in theory, uh, somebody who's the kind of ideal carpenter that I'm imagining. It, it doesn't have to be me. It could be somebody else doing the same thing, paying attention to the classic rules of of carpentry about about how you run materials. I mean, it, it's these are old traditions that I'm trying to. Uh, live by there it's not amazing uh new new inventions but it's um the the, the short version of ponza story is that judd declared a lot of these pieces destroyed eventually they ended some of them ended up being bought by the guggenheim the guggenheim sitting with these pieces that they don't know what to do with, in effect, it's so public that they're destroyed that they can't, unless they were gonna remake them, which is not a, a light subject and it's not a subject that I, 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 would, I, would, I could, would, would make them if, some, if it was decided by the, the authorities and by, by, by general agreement that it, they should be remade, but I'm not gonna be part of that because I, I'm too close to it. So that, this is a short version of the Ponza, Ponza controversy. There's well, a Saatchi, and Saatchi version of this, but, but it's the Ponza one you're asking about. Well, actually, I was just thinking, just so that for this, you know, in case this isn't something um, people are familiar with, I, if I can share my screen, I've got three images from the Guggenheim's website related to um, Panzer um, specifically. So I believe um, that this, can you see that? Mm -hmm. I um, can. So this is the um, certificate that went with one of the works. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks as if there's two handwritings. There is—is is that your writing, the pencil? Uh, no, 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 no. It's yeah. not the blue. The, the blue ballpoint pen writing is Judd's. Yeah. I actually uh, can't. I can't I make out what it says in the middle there. Um, I think if I can zoom in a little bit, um, I will guess. Can you read that, Peter? What um, that says in the middle? The Constitution, something information, and send it. Um, uh, I see. I see. Uh, one's name always jumps out on these things. <laughs> in the second to last line. Yep. We we'll have, have I, Valentine yeah, um, yeah. issue a working drawing of the box, and I think yeah. that's what this is here. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Those are those are my drawings. That's your drawing, and this yeah. is how that work was installed by um, under Panzer's um, uh, oversight, but in a gallery in Madrid. Yeah, um, and I think that this is again, this is a Goog this is all from the Guggenheim's website. This is two images. One is um, that Judd had disowned, I think, on the left, and this mm -hmm. is your work on mm -hmm. the right. Um, on the left, yeah. Your sorry, so your your work on the left and the the European one is on the right. Uh, no, I think mine is on the right. It is on the right, yeah. And, okay. and the left is the European one. And so there, there's a number of things about um, the drawing that that drawing on the the previous one. Yeah, we'll go back to that. Um, I I wouldn't do a drawing like that for myself. 
but we talked earlier about trying to keep the, the art the, the the art if you keep if judge is about keeping the artist's hand out of the um off the piece out of the piece i i sort of am trying to keep the fabricator's hand out of the piece too and including in this drawing so this is this is a very stiff kind of drawing mechanical drawing that uh, and i think it might have been it might have been it was probably a it seemed a good like a good idea to send drawings and descriptions about how to do these pieces and there are some other documents where there's a kind of description about how to do these pieces but it might not be I, if if you get asked how to well a, a true description about how to do a piece would be a, like a 20 20 page um paper and and we, you'd have all kinds of things like be careful not to trip on this and and be careful to clean the, this before and, and the saw blade has to be kept very sharp you'd, it, you'd have all this endless trivial stuff on there so you do a kind of drawing like this and you do a kind of two-page description about how to do it and whether they read whether their carpenters read that or not i don't know but they on this the lower part of this drawing showing this spline this the the, the, the circular insert down at the bottom um they ran those splines which are it's a joining method a removable joining method and they did that and they ran those grooves all the way to the outside edge and it shows mm -hmm. and it doesn't show on the draw, upper, upper drawing thank goodness because it's a it's a hidden spline and it, it seems to me that any carpenter who's thinking clearly or comes from a traditional practice would know that you don't run that groove all the way to the outside edge and at Ponza's there, they, they ran them to the outside edge. They also, in the, in the picture you showed afterwards, didn't use true plywood. They made their own plywood. They didn't use Douglas fir plywood. The, this picture on the right is, is a true Douglas fir plywood. And the one on the left is Douglas fir plywood veneer. And the interior veneers are poplar. So they got some, and so what they're doing, they're really subverting the whole idea of honest, um, everyday, everyday plywood, which is what Douglas fir is in the United States. And it, and it, it until fairly recently was in Britain also, I think, it was used for crates and subfloors and things like that. Now I think it's a little bit harder to get, but it's definitely not furniture wood and it's not treated like furniture and the joints are butt joints and not and not uh, bevel joints that's uh, that's very important when you're making boxes many of which are um are uh, are wall pieces which have there's all kinds of associations that you don't want to occur so you're using butt joints like this and you're not using veneered wood you're using wood that's this, that's the same wood through and through, like on the right here. Uh, Ponza didn't want to pay to bring plywood over from the U.S. or from Britain, if he could have gotten it in Britain. He he had them make um, Douglas for appearing wood veneered on top of of a, another wood, which basically treats the, the veneer as if it's a, a luxury furniture mm -hmm. veneer. It's a, it's really a bad decision. I think about the, on the Ponza situation, I think that Judd made the first mistake um, by, uh, by doing this certificate, these certificates in theory, that would be okay by the way he was doing the delegation by how extreme he was about delegation, but doing it in paper on paper like that with somebody he didn't know so well was the first mistake. But after that, Ponza made all the mistakes. Ponza, Ponza made all the mistakes after that, um, and it, it went really badly, and became this big cause that allows Guggenheim to have a study grant for 
<laughs> for five years, right? And so, so maybe it's maybe it's good because it gives it it gives a lot of people a lot of juicy topics to talk about. I don't mean the kind of uh, interpersonal relationship between collector and artist. I mean the subject of of delegate subjects of delegation and uh, how that why it works and why it doesn't work. And I would like that the fact that it works to not be a magical thing or that I was a very, that I was an unusual one of a kind kind of person in this. I'd, I'd like to think of myself as um, almost a symbolic traditional carpenter. It's not really true, but, but let's, let's, let's say that for now. Mm. Um, but so, so the, the fact that, that Ponza went so wrong it happened. And so discussing it, yes, there's a lot to be discussed there, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder on that note, um, within the same Guggenheim study, as you say, five years, um, that's another kind of GC, isn't it? The kind of grant. Like, to, to well, no, it, yeah, it was, I, I'm not, I know, the, I know all the other people who did that. So I'm, I'm not um, rid ridiculing that. I think it's valuable stuff, right? No, I, I completely agree. And I mean GC in a, in a really good way. But anyway, but within, within the... Um, that text, I think it mentions that um, throughout Judd's career, he worked with um, 30 different fabricators and makers, which also include um, the furniture, the production that he, he uh -huh. designed. And presumably, I know very little about furniture, that, but I believe that that was done under license. So it was probably the closer end to the mass production that Judd... Um, yeah, mass production is, is, um, is, is, is not quite... I never became mass production. Okay. And it just it never got that big, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I just, I just, just for that. Yeah. yeah. No, I just wondered maybe if you could, um, you know, say a little bit more from your point of view of your experience. So we talked about the Bernstein brothers, who are um, metal workshop in New York, um, but of the other kinds of documents and like how those different relationships were forged. So you talk them. It's amazing to think that Judd didn't talk to. Bernstein from the late seventies till his death in ninety four. So you were the kind of intermediary, but with all those other or, or, or other, it wasn't just me. There were you know people in the office. There was a judge, a small judge office, and so sometimes it was them, mm -hmm. and sometimes it could be done on the phone and so forth. But the the furniture, um, I don't know whether you do the furniture or whether you study the furniture. And it, the, it's interesting. The furniture is interesting because it, it, it Judd does furniture, and it. It's a funny kind of um, it. It's a, it's in a funny kind of place because it's it 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 almost occupies the overlap of furniture and art. Some of the furniture is very close to his work. Judd can sit. I think Judd considered his work to be his artwork to be kind of secretly architecture. I mean, the pieces are really like little architectures rather than anything else. I think. But he also considered furniture, he wanted furniture to be considered very separate from the art. But is it really that separate from the art? And sometimes people buy a Judd desk set because they're not going to buy a sculpture. Or, or, so, so they say, come over and see my new Judd. I just bought, I just have a Judd. So there, there is a very, there, there's a, there is definitely an overlap. I think there, if there's furniture here, here and, and, and art here, they, 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 they exist in the overlap of those two things. When I first started working for Judd, before I ever made any pieces, I worked on his building at Spring Street. I sort of learned, I, I made all my mistakes at Spring Street, you, you might say, working on his building, doing walls and doors and things, and some architect and some furniture. And so I made, you haven't been to Spring Street, I don't think, right? Mm -hmm. no. Well, I'll, if you if you come, I'll, I'll or if you bring a group, or either way, I'll I'll uh, I'll take you on a tour there. It's it's really interesting. You can spend a lot of time there, and there's a lot to discuss. I started making. I made furniture for him before I ever made art, and it became. A, it, there was a decision fairly early on that the art. And the, especially once I started making work, that the art 
and the furniture should be two, they should be kept separate. They should be made by separate people because especially for somebody like me, who's a, a small shop, a really a, a, a really like a one man shop or a two man shop, basically. Um, every minute spent working on furniture is a minute you can't spend working on art. It's not a big factory, like some of his later factories where you have different departments and even Bernstein, you know, with the famous name that you hear all the time, Bernstein is a, is a small shop, a, a small shop that mostly made air conditioning ducts and sinks and other commercial work. And the art part of it was way over in the corner, what usually with one guy making those things. It was, it was, it was also kind of a one man shop in a way, in, in essence. If you take that person off of the art to make furniture, you're falling behind, you're already falling behind there. Um, Judd also didn't want his furniture shown um, in the same space as the art. Like a judge show shouldn't have judge chairs in it. Mm -hmm. it. It got violated that rule a little bit sometimes. There was a piece in 1971. I don't have the pictures to to put up. I can maybe I can send them to you, you know, after this or something. But there was a a, a coffee table that Judd made in 1971 that was going to be a set of 20. It was going to be an edition of 20. Um, it looked very much like a floor piece. There are floor pieces with recessed tops that look very much like that. And I think it, it uh, scared him or freaked him out or uh, alarmed him that, that the, his art and his furniture was becoming, was too, too close, at least, especially in that point at that, in that instance. And he stopped that, that the making of those pieces, there were two or three of them made. I think they're very important pieces. He starts every, almost every article he writes about furniture, um, about I had this piece nineteen this this piece in nineteen. I, I mean, I'm 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 going to exaggerate a little bit, but it's, I had I had this terrible uh, experience with this piece in nineteen seventy one. It was a terrible failure. He starts every article about furniture about this. He's kind of saying no, they cannot come that close together. But I know I knew Judd well enough to know that when he talks about, if he doesn't want something to be, if he wants something to disappear, like an ex-wife or a friend that he no longer talks to or something, he just doesn't mention that name. That name doesn't get mentioned. And it's not like he mentions it over and over again. It disappears from the thing. And so the fact that he's starting every article on furniture with this is very telling that this that experience was important to him and I've argued, I, I've restored one of those uh, coffee tables and I have written a little bit about it. And I'm arguing that rather than this being un unimportant, it's one of the most important pieces of furniture he ever did because it's where the road forked. And he, he backed away from that. And the furniture became different after that because it was, it was scaring him that it was too close together. And um, to your question, which I'm not quite answering about, are they done on license there? Actually, they, they never were done in a really commercial, commercially viable way. They were, somebody would order a desk set or chair or a bed, and then they would make it. And they didn't stockpile them any, any place. They were made by, by larger factories but they were never delivery in three weeks. It was delivery in eight weeks or something. It was, it, it was, a, it was a kind of a problem as far as running that bit, that part of the business as a business, because it, you're basically commissioning your, your chair or something. Gosh, uh, that's I, not, I'm not answering your question, but that's, that's the kind of the, a, a general view of the, what the furniture was like. It was made in Switzerland. It was made in California. For a while, it was made at Spring Street, at Judd's building at Spring Street. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't made any, I, the Judd furniture I made was stuff that was built into his building at Spring Street in 1970 and 71. So I, 
I, if I had my choice to work on the furniture or and, and be working on it now, and never have worked on the art or to work on the art, I would choose the art because I, I sort of care about art a little bit more than mm -hmm. furniture. Although, if they're both architecture, architectures, Jed, Jed, I think I mentioned that Jed considered furniture to be a branch of architecture. That's where he placed furniture as a branch of architecture, basically. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure he didn't think of his his work as being a branch of architecture either, right? His artwork. Yeah. So. Um, right. I'm going to come back to that, but just briefly, just to let people know, just because of the technical problems at the beginning, I think we're going yeah, to sorry about that. up at about half past. So if anyone has any questions for Peter, please do put them into the chat. I don't think everyone else can see the chat. It's only the moderators. So I'll take a look and try and pass questions on to Peter if you have any. But in the meantime, I'd like to go back to what you were just saying there about language. Um, and if Judd didn't want to talk about something, it would just be gone. And I was thinking about how he quite often refused terms. Like he didn't like what we, we, we commonly call his sculpture. He didn't like calling it sculpture, he called it mm. works. Um, he writes um, that he doesn't like the word form. Um, he didn't like the word minimalism, which is also another term that gets applied to him quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and almost, I'm, almost always, right? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, I'm and, he, and he, he sort of gave up at the end because it, it's, it, there's no way to fight that, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I, but I wonder, you know, thinking about actually how he communicated to the, given that he didn't lay hands on his own work, but always mm -hmm. communicating with, you know, a range of people as we've heard you, but amongst a, a number of others, he was a prolific writer of essays and critic, critical mm -hmm. writings as well. But actually in terms of writing about, you know, describing what he actually wanted and their, its qualities, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, because it seems like that was a, a real stumbling block, but a kind of an interesting one that he paid a lot of a great amount of care and attention to. Um, but, you know, thinking of the, the kind of drawings that, you know, you included in the um, exhibition um, uh, working papers, you know, from, say, Bernstein as a working mm -hmm. drawing, you know, they're annotated with very technical, like quantitative information like dimensions. Um, material specifications like galvanized and tack welds and so on. Um, he used yeah, the thing is that those those are always those ones that 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 um, specify all that are always the Bernstein drawings. Oh, okay. Right, and Judge ju that that catalog was is divided into, into sections, and the Judge drawings. I, I don't. I could have one here and hold it up in front of the camera, but the the Judge drawings are are, are it's just missing. It's just missing in there, and all all the details. Um, um, and I there's a there's a when I was doing walkthroughs of that show, I sometimes pointed out the difference between a Bernstein drawing of a progression and a Judd drawing of, of a progression. Uh, that, fortunately, we had an example of both, and the Judd drawings they don't show the joints. It doesn't show. The, you have a piece that's made up of of many, many parts like, like this. And when this, when this joins another part, there's a, there's a line there because it's a joint. Judd's uh, drawing of this, this one drawing of his, of a, of a progression showing no joints as if this piece grew organically or was done, was, was, um, was was grown, you know, on a 3D printer or something. Um, and Bernstein Brothers, because they're making the pieces and the guy who's doing the, the, the office that's doing the drawing is doing a drawing for the fabricator, the, the machinist on the, on the shop floor. He needs to show all that stuff and, and specify it because the person who's doing the drawing and the person who's doing the making are two different people. Mm. And Judd is not... Uh, either of those people, in a way, judge judge somebody else, and um, I have very few drawing. When I when I was doing judge pieces, I my drawings are on the backs of envelopes or on the on, on a scrap of plywood or something. Because I'm for me to do a drawing for myself, I'm not that kind of a company where I have an I, where I have an office uh, hat and a, and a and a workshop hat, I'm the same person. And so I didn't do those drawings. I know a lot of people, artists who do do drawings, but when they do, 
it, it's usually not because it's it's complicated and they and they can't remember how they're going to you know do this glue joint. It's because their drawing is part of their wor work and they're going to show the drawings uh, afterwards. Or the drawings are more important than the work, or or they're equally important. I I didn't do do drawings for myself because I didn't need to because I'm the same. I could carry them through the door from my kitchen table to, to through the door into the shop. And um, but the Bernstein drawings, when they're really specified, that's Bernstein doing that's Bernstein or or Laney or Mensikin or any of these other fabricators. They have to do it because there's a there's a a plans desk or a, an office and the there's a there's a, and the person who's doing it has to be told what to do although some of them we can't we're, we're, we're good at doing these pieces and could probably have figured it out himself but they, they needed to be a drawing and it's often a drawing on one side and the and the uh, time sheets on the back side I don't know whether you saw any of those in that show, but on the backside of a lot of those drawings are, are timesheets, you know, an hour and a half on Monday and four hours on, th on Thursday and so forth, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that's not answering your question exactly, but but Judd doesn't do that kind of thing. Judd's drawings are very interesting because they're so strange. Yeah. And I, one of the things that we I discussed in that essay or in person with people who are there in person is that they weren't particularly great drawings either. They weren't very careful drawings because Judd didn't want the drawing to be a substitute for the experience of seeing it. And there are, there are some of the drawings in that show, there'll be a page of draw of, of boxes. I don't like, I, I try not to use the word boxes, but um, I criticized an essay recently of somebody who was using the word boxes, but I'm gonna use the word boxes. There's a, there's a series it says four boxes and they're all the same. And the drawing has three and a half boxes on it. And the fourth box on the right is running off of the page. And I love that drawing because it's so e it'd be so easy to do it again or to make the boxes smaller so they fit on the page. And the fact that you that he's able to sabotage the drawing as a picture of the piece Oh, if you want to see all, if you want to see the piece, go see the piece. You know, I'm not going to give you a, a picture of it. You know, it, it, it's not quite as bad as photography, but it's almost as bad as photography. And so I'm not going to give you, I'm going to run this piece off the page. And you have a lot of things like that with Judd where he has a, a lines showing a vertical and a horizontal that come together to make, to make a corner where they, they don't quite make the corner or they overlap. I don't know whether you remember any of those, but I, I, I love those things because it's a, there's a kind of um, asserting the superiority of the piece to the drawing. Mm -hmm. And some of those drawings in that show were about getting the piece made. And some of them were about documenting the piece in an artist's kind of way rather than a fabricator's kind of way where you'll have... Uh, the, the famous piece at the Tate that's copper, the copper floor box, that's three feet by five feet by five feet with a red bottom. And it's in half inch copper and the bottom is painted cadmium red and it, it's kind of um, glowing from the inside. That, that piece, the drawing for that piece, which was in this drawing show is so wonderful because it's black and white and it and it doesn't show any of the screws that put that piece together. His judge drawing uh, and the drawing was done afterwards. So it's kind of a portrait of that piece. No screws showing, no cracks showing, no color, no colorizing. And it just says cadmium red bottom, uh, copper, um, half inch copper. And it, copper is also has a very strong color and cadmium red is super strong color and all that stuff is missing from the drawing and the drawing is like okay, okay this is a a kind of a conceptual portrait of this piece and the and the piece wins yeah the piece itself wins right basically it, it, I, i'm i'm going a little far afield here here but but and i'm not answering your question exactly but um <clears throat> no it's great actually that, i wonder that, though, on, on that yeah. point um you 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 pointed when we spoke before christmas you pointed to an essay um which is called Some Aspects of Colour in General and Red and Black in Particular from 1993. Yeah, did you, have you read that one? 
Yeah, and I, I mean, it's wonderful, I isn't it? It's a great essay, but also within that, there's a lovely part where he talks about seeing a Roger Van der Weyden um, altarpiece in the museum in Philadelphia, and he says the colours I remember are blue, not soft, and red, high, and slightly rosy. In my present vocabulary, they are similar to Ral Farben three zero two seven, Himerot, Himberot, yeah. and Ral Farben five zero one three. Cobalt blau, um, and that sense of yeah, it, so the question is what what is he what is he doing with that right? Well, yeah, if and you, I'm you can also talk about you know Windsor and Newton um, colors and so forth. But he's you know he's uh, do, do you know the the so called Swiss pieces from the mid eighties uh, these pieces that are made of colored pans screwed yes. together? Yes, he's coming. These pieces that in house they were called Swiss pieces because they were made in, in near Zurich. And I mean, we, we call them that. They're not, officially they're not called that. Officially all jug pieces are called untitled. None of them are called stacks or progressions or, or Saatchi pieces or things like that. But the RAL color, Jud became very enamored of um, things European uh, when he did so much work in Switzerland, uh, the, um, the Swiss pieces. For example, for those and those those colors came out of an RAL color book. I don't, I'm not sure how much it's used in Britain, but in, on, in continental Europe, it's it's the, it's kind of the Pantone color for industrial colors. And Judd started using those, and he had he had several of those books, and he would cut them apart with a scissors and glue them together to, to kind of draw these how he was going to do these kind of pieces. So he's used to he's used to that. He also sort of liked to th throw. Um, German around a little bit, <laughs> Himmel wrote, and you know, Verkehrs, um, Gelb, uh, and things like that. And so he's, it's a little bit um, throwing Europe around when he's doing that. It's also that lecture or that uh, essay. Did I, did I tell you this on before? That that essay was, it, it's a very misleading essay. Because, I mean, it's quite misleading, I think, because it's it seems to be about color. I mean, its title is about color. It was an essay, it was a lecture he was supposed to have given in November, 1993 in Amsterdam on the awarding to him of a, of a of the Sickens Prize and Sickens, uh, double K, Sickens is um, a famous European paint maker, a Dutch paint maker. And they were uh, uh, awarding this prize. And of course, it's it, it had the emphasis is color because they're paint makers, right? And so he has this title that seems to be uh, um, playing the game about being a, about being about color. But I think I read that essay. Yes, there's a lot about color in it. But I think what he really wants to write about is space. That essay, the best part of that essay is about space mm -hmm. and objects making space. And this is why so many architects, I'm not saying this because of your program, but, but I, I do a lot of tours of Judd's buildings and talking to architects and so forth. And architect, many architects, uh, Judd is the favorite artist of many architects. And a tour for art history students from Columbia on a Tuesday and architecture students from Yale on a Wednesday at Spring Street. Those tours are almost the same tour with a little to the left, leaning a little to the left or a little to the right because Judd's architecture and his art are so similar. And he thought of himself as, you know, I mean, Judd did, you know, Judd's architecture, I think, right? The, the, the buildings at Spring Street, the buildings in Marfa. And I, I think if furniture and art come a little too close for comfort sometimes, um, art and architecture really come close um, together, but not too close for comfort. I think Judd liked the idea. And in Marfa, there's one of his buildings, he put his name on one of the buildings as if a commercial uh, storefront that he's basically calling himself an architect, which you can't quite legally do. 
in this country. You can't just write it, call yourself an architect if you're not ready, if you haven't um, got the papers. But um, that, that essay really, I think that's why architects get it so much because judge so much about space, the making of space and not the, not the delineating of space, but the making of space. He, judge claims that you make space, that it doesn't exist, it's not air and it doesn't exist and you make it. And the best architecture does the same. And, it, and, and there's a lot of not best architecture that doesn't really make space. And I mean, that's, you, this is what they're talking, what he's talking about in that essay, disguised as an essay about color. About color, yeah. I mean, I mean I, that's a little a harsh, but when, because color is interesting. It's also architectural in some ways. And you can do things with color that there's bigger colors and smaller colors and you, yeah. can, you, you can use it architecturally, of course, but. I mean, I wonder whether the, the, the samples that you've got there, there's a question here for, uh, from Miguel Falke in the, in the chat says, um, I wonder if Peter could say a bit more on the details of the pieces, for instance, the finishing when painted or else, how did Judd communicate his intentions? Um, the, uh, the pieces I made um, were, most of them were unpainted, but some of them were painted. And the painted ones was, uh, it, it's, I, I didn't like painting them so much. I was, I, I was happier on the unpainted ones, but on the painted ones where I'm painting it, rather than making it and sending it to Judd to paint, I'm doing the painting too. And so I'm, it reminds me of doing that drawing from that Ponza drawing. I, 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 I would have drawn something completely differently, but I was trying to keep my hand out of that. So you end up with this really kind of stilted, funny kind of drawing, you know, that was done with press type and, you know, pretend technical drawing. I'm, I'm pretending to be a tech, to, to be doing a technical drawing. Um, I'm painting a piece of a cadmium red floor piece. And I'm, I know from Judd that one of the reasons he stopped making his own cadmium red floor pieces in 1963 was because his carpentry skills were only up to a certain point. And so when he cut plywood, there would be lots of chips and spackling and things that needed hiding. And he painted the pieces very heavily to cover over that. And you, you'd get a piece that was a pretty, this really famous 1963 piece with all the divisions that, that it's in everybody's art history book. It's a wonderful piece, but you can't, as far as he's concerned, you can't really tell that it's plywood. And he wanted to be able to tell that you should be able to look at a piece and tell everything and know everything about it. And if you can't tell whether that piece is plywood or, or hardboard or plaster or what it is, that's not, something that's something that to be to be solved he stopped making plywood he stopped making his own pieces in six in 63 um i i made the first piece for judd in 19 i did a restoration for him in 69 but my, the first piece i really did for him was in 71 and it was an unpainted plywood piece so the emergence of unpainted plywood where you could see it and you wouldn't, you could know everything about it. You'd see the edges, they, they haven't been taped, they're, they're available, all of the Ponza question, right? You can see, and you can see the joints. And when you, when he wanted to paint some pieces, not unlike the piece from 63 that I was referring to, he wanted that to be a thin enough paint job that you could see not just a transparent wash, but something between, paint and a wash where you could see what the material below it was, that you could see that it was plywood. And that's a tricky one to do, how much, how heavy to go on it. And it was never spelled out exactly. It's just that you should be able to tell what the material is. You should be able to see this through the thing. And this occasionally becomes a problem when you get a, somebody, uh, there's a piece I know of that that has been, has undergone some floods and some hard living and so forth. And you've got to, you've got to, um, 
restore it and it involves paint and the, that paint gets heavier than it was originally. So that's not so, that's a problem. But when they were made originally, they were made with a quite a thin layer of paint. It wasn't spelled, there is no way to spell that out, you know, like one part paint and four parts water or, or you know, so. Um, not answering your question exactly. Energy, I don't that's think. Great. It, but but it's not. It was not specified. But it was it was specified what it sh what it should be what it should be, but not how to do it. Let's put it that way. Right? Well, that's really interesting, Peter. I'm sorry, just because of the time, and I, I'd yeah. love to carry on talking to you all all day. But I because of the overrun, I think we maybe I'll just conclude with one final question from Eleonora. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I haven't got to everybody's questions. Um, she asks a, a question which is something that I think is quite pertinent to contemporary making. Mm -hmm. Do you think if Judd today, um, if, if, if he was alive today, would he produce his pieces with machines, you know, in robotics, if he, in a factory, if he could, i.e. with no human hand at all? Um, I, I, I would say if I had to guess yes or no, I'd say no, because, um, when he did, when he went to Bernstein Brothers, the Bernstein. I mean, there were there were more advanced ways of doing um, pieces, even in in sixty four, than the way Bernstein did. Bernstein is making sheet metal pieces on brakes and shears and re really like nineteenth century kind of equipment. Um, I my shop. I I'll turn the computer over there. It's right over there. That's right over there. Uh, you saw the picture of my shop. It's it's an old. It's got a table saw, and it, it doesn't have a. Um, um, it doesn't have computer assisted saws and so forth. And I, I there, there's a lot to discuss about that. But it's, and you, and and in some ways that would be easier to do, but I think Judd took refuge or moved his pieces from his own hand to into these traditional uh, fields of sheet metal work or carpentry, there's a relationship between those traditional fields and found objects. Found objects were, found objects were a very important intermediate stage for Judd and found traditions. I think they were interesting. They weren't quaint to him. That's not what I mean, but they were interesting to him. I got, I have, these Swiss pieces, which are cut on shears and bent. I get those pieces quite often for restoration. I do that restoration in Switzerland. When I started with a new, the company I use now there, I started with them. They wanted to do, um, to make these pans on, la on a laser cutter. And they were originally cut on shears. And the shears is a, a kind of a chop. It's a big chop machine that chops it. And it basically cuts the first half and kind of breaks the second half. You, Unless you're really looking closely, you wouldn't notice the difference. But, they, but you can get a perfect, on a laser cut or a water jet, you can get a perfect cut. The company made the first samples of that. And I said, no, we can't do that. We, we, you can still do laser you can still do um, shearing. And if the company is any good in the, in the, there should be somebody as good as Bernstein was, as, um, as Laney was in, in 1984. They, if we can't, if they're, the people we're using aren't good enough to, to do that now, we have to find somebody else who's good enough to do that. Those machines still exist. There is a quality to those edges that is a little bit different than a laser cut. I think we, what we need to do is stick with that. There may be a time when nobody has shears anymore, and then you have to decide what, you, what, what you're going to do about that. But I don't. I, I may, I, I, you. I'm not sure how many of the pieces I've made you've seen, but um, some of them are very exact, and they're made on a table saw, with with routers and a table saw and handwork and, and I don't have a computer. Um, in my shop at all. I, I just barely have a computer, as you can tell by how long it took to, <laughs> to join this chat. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, I, it's not that I'm anti-computer on that. And it, it, it's pretty amazing when I see one of those that are set up like that, um, com computer assisted uh, saws and so forth. And you can do really exact work, except as one final part to that answer. When you're dealing, I mean, many of Judd pieces are, are um, 
well, they're they're all somewhat architectural, very architectural, but some of them have very elaborate joints where you're joining things on angles. The problem when you're doing that is that you're, you, you, one of your first problems is the materials. Can you get flat materials? Flatness and squareness are, are two, your, your two big problems. And even uh, I, of all the plywood pieces I made for Judd, when I had just finished a job and I was starting a new job and I say, no, that last job was pretty good, but I know of some things that should have been done better. I, this next job is, but this next job is going to be perfect. This next piece is going to be perfect. And the place where that, where reality slaps you in the face is when you're choosing the materials and you have to just, you, you realize none of these materials are really flat and I need flat materials um, to join these two angles together. Or I, I have to be really good at, not, not tricks isn't the right word, but at, I, I have to figure out some techniques, some unusual techniques to make this work. Metal fabricators have the same problem. The sheets are warped. They're not consistently thick. If you decide you're going you're gonna to make Judd pieces on a computer and you still have um, earthbound uh, materials that aren't flat and so forth. You know, how are you going to manage that? You may have these wonderful cuts and perfect square corners with a with a warp with a warped um, with a big warp in the piece. And how are you going to put those two pieces together? I, I'm not explaining it. I almost have to draw this for you, but it's. It, there's, this is a practical reason why you're, you, you may have very advanced tools, um, not the kind of tools that were used to make jet pieces, but very advanced tools that can do uh, amazing things and rather unamazing materials that are not flat and not consistently thick. Uh, I'm not explaining what, there's a missing part to this, you know, like um, the, you're never going to leave the fabricator's uh, ingenuity or uh, trickiness out, out of the whole thing because you're going to have to figure out how to pull less than perfect materials together and have them look perfect in the end. This well, is, I, I'm a little, I'm a little far afield of, that, of answering the question that you asked, but I, I, the answer to is, would you use computer um, and lasers to make jet pieces? Um, it's a hypothetical question because we're not making jet pieces anymore, but um, no, I think it's closer to what Judd wanted was is to use the traditional. I'm not talking about traditional. Uh, do you know Francis Cape by any chance? No. An, an Eng a London artist, I think he lives in Brooklyn now, but who I know from the Saatchi installation in 1984, who was an artist who made, um, um, door jams and traditional carpentry and windows and things as, as his sculpture. And he used a handsaw, a non-electrical, uh, just a regular handsaw uh, to do it and chisels and, and planes and all, the, all this stuff, which I admire very much, but really isn't part, it, that's going a little too far to the ye olde carpentry school you know, like, oh, there's a straightening plane and so forth. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about using, you know, table saws and, and uh, electrical machines. But the other, ex the far extreme, which is to use the laser thing, maybe it could be argued that where's the, where's the border there? But it, I, I don't think Judd would have gone to that. Or if somebody was doing that, he didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's dying in 94, so there's not, that stuff isn't very developed at the time. Um, Peter, I'm sorry yeah. to say, I, I, I'm afraid I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, but thank, thank you so much. This is so yeah, I'm, I hope I didn't uh, answer, poorly answer the questions you were asking, but... Um, no, but it's it's really. I mean, it's it's wonderful to hear hear from you directly of your your incredible wealth of experience. Um, both philosophically and, you know, and very practically. And I think this is something we don't hear enough of. So it's, it's, it's great. So thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate the time difference is not ideal from your side. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It, it wasn't the time difference. It was the, um, 
the computer skills differences. <laughs> okay. And also, I hope um, for, those, for those in the audience um, that you'll stay in touch with Peter's program at Edinburgh University, which I, I hope will be coming back subject to COVID restrictions being, um, uh, you know, reopened. A big subject, right? Yeah, it's a huge subject and it's it's a really profoundly fascinating one, I think. So thank you so much once again. Do and you have, do you have, do you have uh, 30 seconds left? Uh, sure, go ahead, yes. Okay, the, 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 the next prize winner um, in Edinburgh, when, when we can do it, hopefully in November, but maybe, maybe the university isn't open by then, uh, is named Carla Rovelli, who, who is a, um, a, a theoretic physicist who writes on time, on the subject of time from, from a physics point of view. I want him to write on time from a cultural point of view, from an art point of view, and the subject of sustainability and repeatability, which are subjects that are kind of lingering slightly off camera or off, off in the wings of this whole discussion about um, if something can be performed, if, if we call fabricating performance, which I do, but I'd have to explain a little bit more. But if we call that performing the piece, um, can, if necessary, pieces be re-performed, which they can in music and dance and, and, um, and um, music and, 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 our, and architecture for that matter. So, so he's, I want, I'm going to try to drag him from his physics that he, that he knows so well into the cultural topic of time and art in terms of sustainability and repeatability and so forth anyway that's 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 the next uh, the next person there it's so exciting i hope i yeah. hope we can um get you back again peter in due course and maybe yeah. once that fellowship it was fun i i'm sorry i didn't meet all your your students i, I think they're they're over there yeah, yeah. I, I see their yeah. names the time, I hope. yeah um yes thank, thank you so much nice you finally for re in real yeah, absolutely am i real right yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.